Welcome to the East Ward Update. On this month's program, we'll learn about a city program that's giving young people skills to find new work. We'll hear from Urban League representatives about the Summer Youth Program, and we'll learn about a longtime Winston-Salem institution, workforce development. But first, Assistant City Manager Derwick Page joins me to talk about new jobs coming by way of Herbalife. Derwick, thanks for joining me this morning. Thank you for having me, Councilman Montgomery. As we think about jobs, and it's important for us to think about jobs because when we look at individuals seeking out and working, it's just one of the common things that, that we look for in a good economy is having the opportunity and access exactly. to jobs in the community, having a well-trained workforce, and then being able to connect those individuals to jobs. Um, one of the duties and responsibilities, I think, of council members is to make sure that we're working towards building that type of economy. And so we've done some things and we've recruited some businesses with partnerships and one of those businesses recently announced um, in partnership with some dollars from city, state, county, um, some expansion here in the city. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, we were fortunate to recently have an announcement by Herbalife that they're going to be creating an additional 300 jobs in the city. That actually just followed a June announcement that they're going to be creating an additional 120 jobs. So as you recall, back in 2012, we actually entered into an agreement with them to create up to 500 jobs. To date, they've created about 350 of those. So in early June, they announced that they're going to be creating 120 jobs immediately. And they're actually in the process of hiring for those 120 right now. Those are in fields such as maintenance positions, manufacturing, packaging, forklift drivers, and IS positions. Uh, those 120 positions are currently being um, advertised by Herbalife on their website and are available. But then about two weeks ago, the second week of June, I believe the governor was in town and Herbalife announced that they also were going to be hiring an additional 300 jobs, and those 300 jobs will also be in the areas of management, administration, and IT, and they'll be hiring those jobs as early as the latter part of this year. And so when we think about those type of jobs and we think about access to those type of jobs, what are some of the things that people in our community need to know and understand and how do they get access to those type of jobs? Some of the skill sets that Herbalife will be looking for are communication skills, the ability to work well with others, prior work key certificates a plus, um, prior manufacturing experiences a plus, experience working in food or pharmacy industries are a plus. Math skills are very critical, so those are some of the skills that they'll be looking for as they go through that hiring process. They advertise all their positions on the Herbalife website, which is herbalife.com backslash careers hyphen opportunities. Again, that's herbalife.com backslash careers hyphen opportunities. But then also they work through some of our local agencies such as the Northwest Piedmont Workforce Development Board to help make sure that folks are aware of those positions and how to apply for those positions as they become available. Uh, just stepping away from directly the job piece and then we'll come right back around to it. Um, some people um, have questions around um, some of the things we do as a city uh, to help bring in those jobs, i.e. Uh, incentives. Um, and what was done in reference to some of the jobs coming to Herbalife and what does that mean for an everyday citizen in terms of what type of things were done locally? Locally, um, let me first look at the most recent assistance using some of the Dell repayment funds that we received back in 2006, we actually provided an incentive payment to Herbalife to create 300 new jobs. We provide assistance of up to $150,000, and the way that our assistance will work is each year they will get one-third of the amount of money that's being provided based on the total jobs being existing. So the jobs will have to be in place for four years before they get all $150,000. The company is aware of the city council's commitment to hire local, and they have ex uh, expressed that they will s stress with their HR people and also working with workforce development the need to hire as many local people as possible. They're anticipating that with this next 300 jobs, at least 70 to 80 percent of them will be new hires in our community. And I was going to go there in terms of when we look at those 300 jobs, they're going to be transitioning a facility that they have 
on the west coast Correct. here to the east coast and so some individuals who are currently in some of those positions uh, may choose to transition into roles here uh, in Winston-Salem, correct? That's correct. They're and estimating no more than 30 percent. And then those other jobs would be real jobs opportunities for individuals in the community. And that's the thing that people uh, wanted to kind of emphasize that fact because today those 300 jobs are filled by somebody in some capacity more than likely um, in, in California, but those jobs moving here is, are opportunities for individuals in this community to come in. And so when we look at that, I know there's some plans to have uh, some, uh, some uh, job fairs and other events uh, as we look at those jobs as well as the uh, ones that have been talked about in the past, and I think uh, workforce development will be engaged in that process as well. Um, and those real opportunities, because when people see these announcements, but then no one within their context of relationships in life are in those roles, uh, it kind of dis, uh, disenchants people in terms of, of, of should I even inquire to go after these jobs that they're talking about because nobody I know gets these jobs. And so one thing we really have to be uh, uh, diligent in is, is how do we make sure that you know, people who are qualified, people who are trained, have real opportunity and access to those jobs. And so everything that we can do as a community, as a city, uh, partnering with all the organizations and agencies, I think is necessary because I think one of the greatest prides a person has is they can go work, provide for themselves, oh, yes. and be able to say that they did this and they did it for themselves in providing. And uh, these are opportunities that exist uh, in our community. There was one comment you made in terms of uh, some of the qualifications um, and uh, I may be jumping a little bit, but I know that uh, workforce development uh, may work in a little bit in that area, but in terms of working well with others. You know, some people may take that, you know, for, for granted, you know, and say, well, what does it mean working well, well with others? That's a real criteria somebody has for a job, um, working well for others, but that goes to the sense of those real soft skills uh, that are necessary for jobs. And for whatever reason, different demographics within our community, um, have had challenges when it comes to soft skills. And there are programs that exist that are out there tailored just for that purpose to assist in developing those soft skills um, for adults, but then also helping our young people understand that that importance of having those soft skills moving forward um, is something that's going to be key in having access to jobs, whether it's Herbalife or any other company. Exactly, because so often today, working in teams is critical yeah, in manufacturing and in private sector, even in public sector, working in teams is just so critical today in today's workplace. Yeah. Well, I, I thank you for, for the time to, to really look at, at herbal life and the jobs that exist here. Um, but want to make a, a transition a little bit uh, in, in to talk about some of the things that workforce development, I think they're tied together uh, when we look at herbal life and we look at other job opportunities that are here. Yes. Um, and I'm happy to have with us today William Pass, who is Assistant Director of Workforce Development. And so we're thankful to have you here with us today. Good morning. It is an honor and pleasure, Councilmember Montgomery, to be here uh, to let you know about some services that Workforce Development has available to the community. Great, great. And just kind of segue in, and I'll let you get to some of those, those other um, opportunities that Workforce Development has, but just kind of thinking um, on those same lines and connecting just some of the comments around those skill sets that uh, herbal life will be looking for and even the soft skills kind of things. What, what are some of the things that workforce development does or just the, the perspective around those just general soft skills and how that connects to access to jobs and job stability? You've hit on a big topic. We had a survey uh, within the last year with employers to find out kind of what are your needs. That was the top thing that all employers were saying is many of the applicants that they were seeing were lacking those soft skills, know how to be at work every day, to be on time, to know how to communicate, to work in teams. So what our board is, is we've looked back even further than, say, from high school to middle school. We started at the Head Start level, where we have what we call Head Start to Employment. Uh, we kind of talked to the Head Start administrators, found out that many of the topics that they were teaching in their curriculum were basically related to soft skills with the communication, uh, with working as a team in the daycare setting. So we kind of incorporated our, our strategies on trying to address all of those soft skills with Head Start. We had even a monthly competition with the Head Start program to say, okay, this month our theme is going to be teamwork. 
um, then each Head Start provider would actually provide us something and say, this is the way we're going to be teaching our Head Start program about teamwork. So we even starting at that lower level, but definitely coming up to the middle school and through the high school level as well. When you talk about Herbalife, one thing that they do with all new employees, they still put them through a program called the Simulated Work Environment uh, that Forsyth Tech has. And it's where basically a team concept where they're actually building, I believe, a cab of a uh, Caterpillar tractor. And they have to work in teams on, on, on the proficiency, um, the, the efficiency of, 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 of them doing that project. They work together as a team. They go back and meet, look at their data. They go back to the drawing board again to see how can they be more efficient. Well, we lost a lot of screws this time. How can we prevent loss of screws or whatever again? So they're doing a lot of things along those lines, and the board fully supports any type of training programs like that. And, and I think that's necessary for the public to understand, you know, yes. though the, that that exists. And some of the things is that, you know, some of those individuals who probably stand in need the most of, of those trainings often don't recognize that they need those those True. those type of trainings and um, I, I, I know kind of I guess from the inside piece around from the uh, uh, my time working with Head Start of, yes. of, of how that came in and, and just seeing firsthand how uh, they began to work in those classrooms mm -hmm. to deal with and begin to show because when you begin that process at that age and that's something that's ingrained as you uh, go through and matriculate through school now when you're going into looking for that job those are skills and those are things that are now embedded in you and ingrained just in, in who you are sure. um, and it takes less than an effort you know when you're older to try to teach you some skills that you Correct. you could have learned at another time but this is the thing I think people need to understand is that it's never too late to learn oh, true. it's never too late to learn and in the world that we live in in the economy we live in that is even more important for people to understand that you have to be learning new skills you have to learn uh, new ways to do things and new ways to think um, and some of the things that uh, were were used in the past you have to find a way sometimes how do I use those skill sets just in a different setting um, and because some of those skills are transferable uh, but I know that uh, workforce development has a lot of other programs as well you want to tell us about some of the other things that workforce development does sure I want to start off kind of telling you the role of the board mm -hmm. the board's role is basically to be the convener of workforce development services in the seven counties that we actually serve we recently added Caswell to the counties but we actually serve Caswell Davie, Forsyth, Rockingham, Stokes, Surrey, and Yakin counties. And what the board wants to do is, again, hear what the employers are telling us. What type of skill sets are you actually looking for? Then we want to translate all of that information over to our career centers so our career counselors and our partners will know these are the type of skill sets that these employers are looking for. We want to work with all of our training providers, such as in this area as Forsyth Tech, in developing classes that's needed to meet the needs of the employers. But we can offer any type level of service. And again, I say it's, it's a free uh, type of service. Uh, this is paid with taxpayers' dollars. We get funding, and our legislation just recently changed. It's now under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. We can use those funds to serve our customers. Our customer basically is our employers as well as our job seekers. We want to get a person, when they come through the door, assess them, find out what their needs are. As you mentioned, lifelong learning. It doesn't matter if a person comes in and doesn't have a GED, or we can assist someone who has a high degree as far as a master's degree. But as you mentioned earlier, that a lot of those skill sets, even at the master's level, may have been outdated. So those individuals have transferable skills, but it's my job as a career counselor to find out, okay, with these transferable skills, what do I need to add to this in order so that you can be marketable in today's workforce? But it can include any type of short-term continuing education uh, class trainings, uh, computer training we want to definitely stress. As you mentioned, uh, the career readiness certificate, we want everybody to reach that goal level with that because it's showing the employer you're strong in your math skills, you're strong in your reading skills, you're strong in locating information. We can also assist for up to a two-year period if somebody's trying to pursue an associate's degree level. If it's someone even trying to pursue a bachelor's degree, we can assist during that last year. We ask uh, supportive services, any type of equipment, uniforms that may be needed, transportation assistance. We can uh, issue bus passes, uh, fuel cards to assist someone who's going back and forth from training, or even in the case where someone has secured employment but need assistance maybe with fuel costs to be able to get to and from work. Then in a couple of other type of training programs, we understand most individuals that we meet with may not be able to financially attend school, do not work and attend school. 
So we offer programs like one is called on-the-job training. If we find an employer that's willing to work with us, we have an individual that has most of the skills, and I'm just going to use welding as an example, have most of the skills, but say this employer wants this individual to have maybe these four other skills in order to, for them to say that they're employable. We'll go in and negotiate with that employer and say, well, listen, if you go ahead and hire this individual, what our agency will do is we will reimburse you 50% of that person's salary for a specified period of time, whatever is determined necessary to learn those four or five skills, wherever the skill gap was at. We'll reimburse that employer 50% of that individual's salary for whatever time period, normally up to a six month period. Then another type of training that we talk about is called work experience. Many times if it's a young person, even an older person at some time, may not have any type of work ethic, may mm -hmm. have never worked before. So once again, we'll go find employers, and we've even worked with the city, I know, through our service corps program. Well, we'll ask the city, if we put this individual on our payroll and cover the person with workman's comp, will you allow this person to actually work with you, develop those skills, teach them a little bit about the ind industry that you're working with? And at the end of it, I'll even tell the customer, even if that employer isn't able to, help, to hire you due to budgetary restraints, still, it was a successful piece because, again, you've developed uh, a job that you're able to list on your resume. Hopefully that employer thought enough of you to be able to, to serve as a reference for that individual. So those are just some of the type of different training programs. But again, I say it's, it's no one type of employment plan mm -hmm. that fits all. One person, we may have to start again from the GED level saying, well, okay, well, I need to help you with that. Um, we also have to look at a person's home life to see when we meet with them. If there are any other needs that need to be addressed, if a person doesn't have a home, well, I can't talk about putting you in the school for a two-year program if you don't know where you're going to be sleeping the next day. You don't have food on your table. So we'll try to do a combination. Let's set our priorities. Try to find you housing. Try to find you food. But in the meantime, while you're doing that, there are still other type of trainings that you can be involved in, maybe more so than trying for your degree program right now, but short-term training programs that help you in any industry, computer classes. That's, that's always going to be successful to help anybody. Again, working on the career readiness certificate. We have people that want to go into electrical, and their math and reading levels are very low. Well, what we'll do is say, well, let's work in basic skills so you can get your scores up. But in the meantime, there's a lineman course that's offered through Forsyth Tech if you're interested in electrical work. Let's put you through that lineman training class, get you employment. After that, again, we're about developing career pathways for everyone. After you finish the lineman program and gone on to work, then let's talk about getting you into some type of degree program so that, again, you can continue to advance and, and be self-sufficient and, and, and really be able to assist your employer. And I, I think uh, one of the key things you, you said in, in many of the programs that, that are done and the process that works is that we're looking at career pathways. And, you know, it's one thing just to talk about get a person a job and, 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 and they're on a job. But when you think about a career and, and a pathway to that career and you begin to look at it and they say that, you know, I want to be a nurse, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I hadn't finished high school um, and I'm, I'm having issues with, with uh, someone keeping my child while I try to go to school just to finish my GED. The opportunity to be with an organization that would take the time to help map out that pathway yes. to get to uh, becoming that registered nurse, okay, saying, okay, this is where you are, these are the current barriers that you have, but this is where you, you need to go, this is what you need to do in order to get there. First thing, we need to work on you getting that GED before you can even get into any of the other programs that are existed there. And we help with that process to, to direct you and connect you to those things. And uh, I think as much as we can do to help get out more um, opportunities for people just to realize that these services exist in our community, um, that, they're, that they have access, just the fact that you reside in this community, you have access to these type of programs. Um, I think it's something that continues to enhance, but at the same time, it's a sense of getting that training, but then after they've get, gotten that training, a question of do the jobs exist out there, where do I get the jobs uh, that, could, that help me to get the careers that I'm looking for, that's, that's going to be a long-term type of thing that I'm looking for. Um, and, and I just want to also throw out to you, as you said, trying to get the word out on the services. We're fortunate to have a mobile job link unit here for our area. 
Um, it's basically a classroom on wheels, 10 computer stations, plasma TV, sound system, DVD, uh, copier, scanner, printer, combination. And what we do is try to take the mobile unit out in the community. And we'll let the community know that the mobile unit has a limited amount of space, but we can at least get you information. We can use the internet to get someone registered in our system. Then we're gonna direct them to our workforce center because that's gonna be the portal for services. With the workforce center, we have partners, Forsyth Tech, Goodwill, DSS, Voc Rehab, the Urban League, where we're all working at the, at the workforce center. And what the intent is, is no matter who walks through the door, we want to be able to direct you to the staff person and agency that will be able to help you. Again, it's about collaboration that's really important under this Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, where we're ba basically trying to leverage all of our resources and provide all these services to the community. So, so if I'm looking to, to gain access there, where do I go? to find out information, where is the, the center located and who do I contact? Okay, you can contact our Workforce Center. It's located at 450 West Haynes Mill Road. It's formerly, everyone knows as the unemployment office, but that's the location for it. You can go right in there and access the help. You can also visit our website at www.p as in Paul, T as in Tom, R as in Rick, C as in Cat, dot org, and go to the Workforce Development link and you can get information on our services, location for all of our centers as well. All right, well, Mr. Page, Mr. Pass, I thank you all so much for coming and, and having this dialogue, much needed dialogue, and, and we could talk a whole lot yes, more uh, about all of, of that needs to happen and, and the opportunities that exist. Um, and I probably, we'll probably have some more conversation in around this because it's just so much enriching information for our community. And so again, thank you all so much for being here with us. Thank, thank you. When we return, we'll learn about the city's program and getting youth prepared for workforce. Money for college, a job when you graduate. The Winston-Salem Police Department has you covered. Learn more about HBCU scholarship opportunities at WSPD.org. The Winston-Salem Police Department, reach for excellence. Welcome back to the Eastport Update. My next guest is Sharon Johnson, who oversees the city's youth build program. Sharon, glad to have you today. I uh, want you to talk just a little bit ab about the Youth Build program. I um, know we're in different stages of the program as it stands now, but uh, just to educate the public about what the program does, where we are within the program, and what's the future um, of the Youth Build program for us here in the city. Well, good morning. Thank you so much for um, having me here. In reference to our current Youth Build program, we're in the last phase where we are support, uh, providing supportive services to our participants who have enrolled and successfully transitioned. And what that means is we are now focusing heavily on job placement and being able to use some of the grant funds for additional certifications to help with tuition if they are pursuing post-secondary education, for uniforms if they have become employed as CNAs, also to help with books and things of that nature. So we're really excited about being able to partner with Goodwill and a lot of the other um, agencies that we normally work with in providing those additional certifications and also looking at building uh, on those certifications that they have. For example, if they are a CNA, then they can look at Winston-Salem State for post-secondary education. We are able to take those grant dollars and to be able to support them through assisting them with tuition, assisting them with books, assisting them with uniforms. So we're very excited about the full focus that Youth Bill has allowed us to not only help them get their GEDs, get a nationally recognized construction certification, but then help them pursue those additional goals that they want to be able to pursue um, to better their, their futures. So we're excited about that. We have also applied for another $1.1 million. So we are so excited about the opportunity to be able to apply for a second round of funding through the Department of Labor. The great thing about the second opportunity is that it has what they call a construction plus component. And so what it does is it takes youth build to another level. So not only will they be able to get their GED and get uh, a nationally recognized construction certification, but it has allowed the city of Winston-Salem to broaden the focus of the participants for those jobs that are in high demand in our area. So for example, um, we, can ha we have a CNA track, we have a pharmacy tech track, we have an advanced manufacturing track, we have a facilities maintenance track. So all of those things that will then feed into the biotech park 
Uh, we have all of the medical facilities that are here. All of those types of jobs are in high demand. And so with this new grant, we are able to bring those participants in, use those grant dollars to then get them prepared from the beginning, the onset, because typically it's a three-year grant, the onset um, in those fields that they have desires to be in that are in addition to construction. So we're really excited about that. Definitely exciting uh, to, to see where we are, uh, what we've done so far, and then where we're looking to go. Um, one thing I want to step back and, and, and have some conversation around and then go to, to the opportunities that exist under this new grant we're applying for. Okay. Uh, what are some of the criteria in terms of those individuals who were admitted into a youth build? Uh, there are some things. This, this grant is, is targeting a specific demographic of people. Um, That's correct. And so there, there are some certain things that they uh, have to have or have not done in order to qualify uh, to be a part of the program. And what are those? The two main criteria that you have to have are you must be between the ages of 16 and 24, and you must be a high school dropout. So you must have both of those things. In addition to that, you can be a, a current foster child, you can be a youth um, of an incarcerated parent, you can be low income, you can be a migrant farm worker, or a youth adult offender. So in addition to being 16 to 24 and being a dropout, you must meet one of those other criteria in order to participate into the program. And, and the reason I wanted to kind of put some attention there is because sometimes uh, those individuals who may be in that area may feel as though there are not too many opportunities that are out there for them. Um, yes, you have just kind of the, the uh, GED programs that exist for individuals to go and finish out um, their, uh, their, their high school uh, uh, education, but the way this program is set up, it also adds that training component to that that uh, makes you um, even more um, desirable right. in terms of the workforce. And I think that's an important piece for us to understand as a community as we're looking at, for whatever reason, um, and there are many reasons why individuals may have dropped out of high school, um, and a lot of social uh, things that, uh, that circle around those individuals. but when they come to the standpoint of saying that they want to continue some education or seek out some opportunity in career, it's good to know that there are things that exist for them um, in this program and then others that are in the community as well exactly. for them to be able to access how do I continue on in my career, how do I continue on in my life to make what has happened in the past something that I can build upon. Right. And I think that the Youth Build program helps to target that population in a very good way. Um, I think we've seen some great successes um, and some good success stories um, out of the program so far. Uh, but the exciting piece, I think, is also what we're looking at in, in the future. Um, I know that uh, myself, others on council have uh, really wanted to know how can we make sure that individuals are being trained and developed for the careers that are going to exist in our economy and in our community. Uh, when we look at places like uh, Innovation Quarter, when we look at more of the knowledge-based jobs that exist in our community, um, there are populations which often make up large percentages of those individuals who are some of the job, uh, those who drop out, particularly some of our minority uh, individuals, those uh, the African Americans, Hispanics, and people of color who make up large portions of those numbers are often absent from many of those jobs. And so exactly. this question, how do we help connect um, individuals to those opportunities? And I think the, uh, the plus piece on this for this new grant um, opportunity, I'm glad that uh, the uh, Department of Labor has been able to add that portion to the grant because it allows communities like ours to say, okay, this is what we need. These individuals have had some challenges, but they're ready now. Right. Um, and we want to help bridge that gap for them to kind of get that access. Uh, so um, I know that we're in application process, and uh, where do we stand with that as, as we look now? Well, we have submitted the grant and we are waiting to hear back from the Department of Labor if we're going to be funded. So we are feeling very um, excited and, and anticipating uh, getting a yes nod, considering we have met all the goals of the current grant that we currently have. So we're just waiting. We should hear no later than probably September, whether or not we've been funded. And the whole Construction Plus piece is the essence of communities being able to look at those high demand jobs that are in their areas and being able to say so in this grant we've been able to uh, upfront establish some great partnerships continuing with Forsyth Tech mm -hmm. but CVS for example um, for the pharmacy tech is, is partnering with us uh, in a shattering opportunity for those folks who choose that track also um, 
out at the airport. Uh, we've been very successful with getting even our current participants placed in jobs. So we're just excited about all of the things that are going to be happening in the future. And the city of Winston-Salem has kind of been at the forefront in terms of looking at special populations and trying to provide opportunities for them to get employment and participate in these kinds of programs. So I'm excited about being a part of that and uh, just helping our citizens recapture their lives through Youth Build and other programs that we have. So we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but the normal process for application for the Youth Build program and, and how do people in the future gain access to that type of information? Well, what we've been doing, because since we've implemented this current program, we receive calls daily, so we've established a waiting list. So if they would contact 336-734-1283, which is Antonio McCoy, who's our current program manager, we're establishing a program list. And then what will happen is, is when we receive confirmation that we're funded, we will post the job just like we do any other position on the city's website, and they will be available to then come to the Bellevue Recreation Center and work with Youth Build staff to apply. Okay, sounds right. good. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, Thank our, you. Our, we're also joined here today with Mr. Don Williams, who is the interim president and CEO of the Urban League of Winston-Salem. We're so happy to have you here with us as well. Thanks for having me. And just want you to uh, talk a little bit about the city partners with uh, the Winston-Salem Urban League on the program um, and a number of other things, but in particularly um, in and around the uh, summer youth employment uh, opportunity that exists uh, through a grant that's uh, given to uh, the Winston-Salem Urban League to help uh, give some job opportunities to uh, youth and individuals in our community. Uh, Urban League does a lot of other great work, particularly in helping connect individuals around careers and jobs as well. Um, just hope you could just talk a little bit about those things for us. Okay. Yes, uh, we received the Summer Youth Employment Program grant with the city again for this year. And the program basically structures itself around the business consortium model that the Urban League uses. Uh, we will bring in students, in this case they're 15 to 19 years of age. Uh, they do meet the need requirement. Uh, most of them are financially need. The city sets some guidelines as far as the poverty level and index that uh, students are required to meet. And we enter them into our business consortium model which um, aligns them with a particular business in the area. Some of them are nonprofit, some of them are for profit businesses. Um, and they will work with them for 28, for 16 hours a week and spend four hours a week with the league uh, receiving job placement training or job training. Now, the intent is that we do an in intake assessment kind of like what uh, was described by Mr. Pass. Uh, it sounds similar, but then there again, uh, the Workforce Development Board is part of our consortium as well, same as Goodwill. So we do the intake to identify what some of their critical needs are, what some of their skills are, as well as what their career interests are. And we're able to reach out to the businesses in the community. If they're interested in retail, we may have a retail partner such as Macy's. Uh, if they're interested in food service, we have tropical smoothies, flashback smoothies. K and W. If they're in the banking industry or interested in those type of operations, uh, some of our business partners may be Wells Fargo, Bank of America, uh, True Liant, uh, any of those financial institutions. So we're able to get them in with those operations. The process will give them a better understanding and appreciation of what's required in the working world. Uh, in most cases, this is their first job. So they learn the importance of being punctual. Uh, we will, in our workshops, work with them on things such as team building, creative thinking, um, those processes that make you successful on the job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so how, how is it in terms of kind of looking at those, those young people that come in uh, to the program uh, and have that experience. Uh, what are some of the things that you hear uh, from the from the young people uh, after they've gone through that process? Well, it's it's an interesting um, sort of feedback that we get. Most of them definitely find it a gainful experience for them as far as developing them and joining them. We have a number of students that have actually joined us again for the second and even the third year. Um, the biggest things I think that we get from them is what it does for them from the standpoint of 
being able to learn a little bit about how you manage your finances, that financial freedom that they might get, as well as the responsibility that they learn. Uh, I think what they find is life in the academic environment is going to be a little different in the real world. Definitely, definitely, and and uh, for many of them, I'm, it's it may be uh, some of their first structured jobs. Is in, that, most, in a lot of cases, this is their first structured job. Uh, I can recall my my first job, my first real job, uh, was working at Chick Fil A, and mm -hmm. uh, it was an interesting thing. I enjoyed working at Chick Fil A, but uh, I had to learn a lot of things um, in in working with that and being able to have that own responsibility uh, that when you're scheduled to work and what time you're there and what time you need to be there and mm -hmm. that getting there if I'm scheduled to work at 12 getting there at 12 may not be the best thing to do but exactly. probably getting there at, at 1145 is 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 a better uh, process and getting to work and getting there and to be in place and ready to work at those times I think that we're able to help our young people understand and get that skill set and understand that it goes back into the connection of the conversation earlier uh, with workforce uh, development um, and with Mr. Page about those soft skills uh, right. of how do we help our young people learn those soft skills so that when they're ready to transition into jobs and careers that they have the skill sets that are necessary and that employers are looking for that's going to make them successful as an individual but also making them uh, be able to provide something uh, of benefit to the organization that they're a part of. All right. Well within that we also focus on some of the pitfalls as well. What we have found is that the challenges facing our youth are similar but uniquely different from those that may face our seniors. We also run a senior program called CSEP, Senior Community Service Employment Program, and I'll use the example of social media. What we find is that most seniors are probably not as um, literate on how to use the social media devices, an example, the smartphone, um, how to surf the web. You know, everybody goes through uh, a portion of where we teach them how to do the online resume developing, uh, how to do the online resume applications. We do that for the youth and the seniors. We find it more challenging for seniors and that they have not, or they're not as skilled with the skill uh, with the keyboard. The challenge with youth is not that they're not skilled with it; they're very skilled with it. But we teach them the proper use. We teach them that uh, posting this inappropriate picture on the web will haunt you for the rest of your life as well as the other choices that you make so we focus on those things and a lot on the soft skills as well we, we work with soft skills all throughout our population uh, for the youth the seniors those in the mid-range of employment um, to help them develop those workforce behaviors those team building interactions that allow them to be successful yeah, and I think it's a good thing for, for our young folk to, to be educated on many of those things. And I think, um, I, I, arguably, I, I'm not necessarily sure where I stand on employers using uh, social media like your Facebooks and Twitters as, as a part of their consideration, but that happens. It happens. They, it they happens. look at that in terms of when you put in that application, you know, just as they do a background check, they do a social media check. Right. Um, and and look at at your your pages and mm -hmm. and what are you tweeting about and and mm -hmm. what are you stating um, and, and and to an extent there's an understandable piece because you're going to be associated with that organization and uh, they want to see what type of representation you have but then also there's some opportunities for them to examine some character things that may not come out in the interview um, mm -hmm. but uh, young people sometimes don't understand that you know something that may be done just in that moment of fun or that thought. Uh, that it has those lasting implications uh, to yeah, even yeah. looking at mm -hmm. uh, at employment, and uh, you know, it, I, I tweeted that you know uh, two years ago or, or four years ago. Now I'm graduated college and looking for that job, and they go back and they're looking at something that you posted uh, that far back, but it still does have those type of implications. So just being cognizant of that and and what that does and how that plays in jobs and jobs, because you already have individuals who are coming in often with some barriers and then right. you don't want to add to the barriers that exist for those jobs. Right. And so I, I know you also mentioned a bit about the senior um, program itself. Right. Uh, what are some of the other things, I know we've, we've just been centering this conversation around jobs, careers, and work. What are some of the things that Urban League does in around helping individuals gain access to employment in the community? We do a number of different things. Most of it centers around job development and job training. We also have programs for ex-fenders in their uh, posse program. 
And POTSI program is kind of a stipend program as well. It also works toward the health issues within mm -hmm. the community where uh, POTSI members go out and uh, do community training on the prevention and transmission of sexually um, transmitted infections. Um, we also incorporate this part of it into maybe the youth because it's a part of it that's called straight talk and it helps uh, youth to one identify and avoid some of those pitfalls but the other thing that you also recognize is that there are recovery programs for felons as well as veterans that we also service. One of the new programs that we're working on right now is a heavy equipment highway construction program. Students will go through, I think it's an 80 hour program, it's an eight week program in which they will come out of it with some certifications. One will be a flagger certification as well as some certifications to operate the heavy equipment. And we are targeting ex-felons and women with uh, criminal backgrounds for that program. So that is another program we use. For our general population, between our partners uh, and our business consortium, we identify what are some of those barriers that might prevent one from getting a job. Um, we recognize that substance abuse or um, the mental health issues might be a part of it. There we partner and collaborate with Centerpoint uh, Human Services, Insight Human Services, and the idea is that if we identify something that is impeding that performance, they can give them that type of counseling and development. And it's a retrocyclical relationship in that those, it has been proven that people are more successful with recovery from addictions when they're employed. So we're able to use our business consortium to link them into employers that will be able to put them into those living wage positions. So those are some of the things that we do. Um, we also recognize that being successful in the work environment may also deal with how you manage your finances. Mm -hmm. So we have some financial partners that work with us to show the different aspects of um, how you manage your money. We're not going to do an investment counseling, but you know, within the myriad of um, financial services, some of the things that seniors need to be concerned about in most cases might be the fraud, those scams that take advantage of those, and our partners will share that part for the youth. Maybe they've never had a bank account, so we help them understand how you set that up, our general population, how do you work with e-banking. Um, there are a lot of people that are still very uncomfortable with direct deposits and things like that, so we show them how that works as well. Well, definitely there are a plethora of resources in our community that are helping to connect, train, and edify our community so that they're, one, better individuals, but then also how we're working with developing workforce of individuals, keeping people employed, helping people get uh, reconnected to employment um, in, in the beginning of this conversation today of, of dealing with new jobs that are coming in. As Mr. Page talked about Herbalife, uh, and then with uh, Mr. Pass talking about the programs that workforce development has. and. Uh, with, with Ms. Johnson here talking about uh, the Youth Bill program and the future of that program. And, and then, Mr. Williams, we thank you for, for talking about the Urban League and the programs that exist there. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, individuals in our community who are ready, willing, and able, uh, we should have the opportunity for individuals to get access to jobs and training. Um, and the, as those opportunities exist, I think it's a duty of our community and those who are endowed in positions like ourselves to try to make sure that the community is aware as possible of those yes. opportunities that exist. At the end of the day, it's the individual who has to take advantage of that, but if we do our part in making sure that people have access and that there are barriers that are removed out away from that access, that they have that clear course to getting there and the assistance um, mm -hmm. in, in working through that process because uh, you know, every, every now and then we all need a little, a little push, a little, right. little coaching on, on how we get there, uh, but at the end of the day, if that can help connect someone uh, to get that training and that education and then that transitions to them and that job and that career uh, that has the opportunity to help change a life, change a family, um, and really helps us as a community to be better 
Um, and so I'm so thankful for all of you all to join us today. I'm thankful for uh, all the others who've been with us today. So again, thank you, Don. Thank you, Sharon, uh, for being with us today. That's all for this edition of the East Ward Update. This program is available on the city's YouTube channel, City of WS. I'm Council Member Derwin Montgomery. Thanks for watching.